Alrighty, welcome ladies and gentlemen to another episode of Whose Gene Is It Anyway? I am your host, as always, Justin. Welcome to the stream. We've got a really good one for you today, I think. And I'm pretty excited. How is everybody doing today? I hope you're doing well, because today we are talking about fungi, and I love me some fungus. It's a fungus among us. It's going to be a good one. So I hope uh, I hope everybody's excited. Alrighty. So I'm going to just, uh, you know, the, the stream's already been going for a, cut for a minute or so, so hopefully everybody's here. We'll probably have a few people filtering in as we get going, but that's okay. Now just a couple quick housekeeping things before we get going. Uh, I've got a bit of a presentation prepared, so we're going to work through it. But if you want me to respond to a question during, you know, as we're, as we're working, then the best way to get me to do that is to donate. There's a link below in the description to, um, like a donation link if you'd like to chip in. It's always greatly appreciated. You don't have to, but it, it, it does help the show. Uh, as you can see from the donation bar underneath, it's for neuron supplies because... Since we're talking about fungus thoughts, we're also going to be talking about neurons, and the Neuron Project, for those of you who've been following the channel for a while, is well underway. I'm very excited. We'll talk more about that later, but we'll get back to it in a little bit. So yeah, if you want me to answer a question, uh, there's the donate link below. You can also use Super Chat or any of the other things. Um, but yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully it's going to be a good show. I, I, think, I think you guys are going to like it. So... Let's, without further ado, let's get into it. So let me just start my presentation. Alrighty, here we go. Okay, so, fungus thoughts. Now, we'll, we'll get into, you know, what we mean by do fungus think in a little bit, but let's start with basics. First off, where did this idea come from? Uh, I did a poll on the community tab on YouTube uh, about nine days ago, uh, asking which topic you guys wanted me to cover today, and seeing fungus thoughts won by a significant margin. So that's what we're talking about today. In the style of the, you know, the old Whose Gene Is It Anyway streams that I, I did a little while ago, uh, basically the way this works is we pick a ridiculous idea, and then we work through it and figure out how to make it work. Now, Something I learned from the last streams was two hours of me doing research live doesn't typically feel very interesting to watch. So I've done a lot of the legwork in advance, but we'll still do some of the coding and stuff like that near the end, where we're actually going to do some genetic design and some, you know, writing some DNA code to see fungus thoughts. So, but we'll get back to that in a little while. All right. So I'm going to just take a two seconds, just check on, on the old commenters. Um, also, we have a moderator, so, you know, behave, please. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we do have a moderator, so, you know, if anybody is being a jerk, you, you will be muted. But other than that, uh, if there's any, you know, links or other stuff that we need, uh, they'll, they'll throw them up in there. Uh, at the end of the show, um, I didn't do it in advance because I was working on this presentation until literally 10 minutes ago. So, <laughs> whoops. But uh, after, the, after the show, all the different papers and resources and all the different stuff that I talk about in the show will get linked down below. So definitely be sure to check back for that uh, probably in a, in a couple, in, in a, get within about an hour after the end of the, uh, the stream, just because I, I didn't have a chance to put it in there right away. But that's okay. All right, so let's get into the actual stuff. So first things first, fungus. There is a fungus among us, and fungus are truly, truly fascinating creatures. So fungi are a branch of the tree of life that unfortunately doesn't get nearly as much... Oh, oh, we got a, we got an ambulance going by. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Hopefully, hopefully everybody's okay. Anyway, um, fungi are some of the most interesting members of the tree of life, but... They're also largely neglected by biologists. There is a growing trend of, of learning about them and studying them and figuring out how they work and, and all the amazing things that they can do. But it's still a very young science as these things go. There's, like I say, there's, there's just not a lot of, of work. When I was in university, I, I tried taking a class on fungi and mushrooms, and it was 
painfully boring. It's, it's sort of this classic case of a lot of the times, I don't know why this is, but for some reason, biology teachers and professors are either some of the most interesting people you're, you'll ever meet or just eye-wateringly boring. <laughs> and unfortunately, this, this professor was the latter. So I ended up dropping that class, which is a bummer, because fungi are really, really fascinating. And I ended up, you know, learning about them on my own. And I've now that I, you know, do genetics for a living and, and I do a lot of bio, I've grown a lot of different species of fungi. I, I you know, there's, they're just, they're, you know, I've gone mushroom foraging. They're just a really cool thing. My, uh, I once asked my, my plant professor, who was one of the coolest people I've ever met, which, you know, this is what I'm talking about. You know, professor, bio professors are either the coolest or super boring. He was the former. Uh, his, <laughs> it really, it felt, every time I went to one of his classes, it really felt like being in Harry Potter a little bit. Like, his his name was Root. Like, that's, like, he didn't change his name. He was, His name was Root. Like, that's his given name. <laughs> um, very, very cool dude. He would you know, take time off the semester to go tend his maple trees. He was a, he would canoe to school. Very cool guy. But at one point, uh, fungi came up during one of the lectures and I, I asked him about them after. And his, his response was basically like, I don't, I don't talk about fungi. Fungi are too weird. Fungi are sessile animals. And I mean, he's not wrong. Like it's, that's not a bad way to think about what fungi are. And because, I mean, they kind of are, like, fungi are ridiculously close, like, genetically to animals, which is part of what what makes them so immensely weird. Uh, we're both in the group of Pithsicons, which means that at some point in our life cycle, we exist as a single cell with a, a, a single cilia that points backward, or a single flagella, I should say, that points backwards. This is a sort of what makes fungi and animals unique. But... Yeah, fungi are, are really, really strange. They're, they're animals that don't move. It is not the perfect way of thinking about them. They're not animals, but the more you learn about them, the, the more it can feel like that. Uh, including in the fact that, you know, they seem to do some amount of... I don't know if cognition is probably too strong of a word, but we'll get more into that a little bit later. So let's, let's first talk a little bit about the, the basics of fungi. There's essentially five main groups... Um, depending on who you ask, you know, they'll, sometimes they'll throw in an extra group here and there. But there's basically five main ones. Um, the ones that I find the most interesting are the Basidiomycota and Ascomycota, because that's where all of the fun stuff is. Um, Glomeria mycota and Zygomycota are more of the molds. Uh, they tend to be infectious or molds or this sort of thing. Whereas uh, Basidiomycota are what we would think of as the mushroom producing species. Ascomycota is a mix where you have some mushroom producing species, but you also have things like baker's yeast, which are single cellular. So it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum um, in that one little group. In terms of the traditional like mushroom life cycle, so now we're talking mostly the uh, Basidiomycota and, and some of the Ascomycota. This is sort of the, the cycle that it, it goes around, where you have the mushroom. The thing that we think of as fungi or as mushrooms, right, is actually just one tiny little part of their life cycle. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But the, the, the mushroom is the fruiting body. It's, it's the, uh, well, uh, sex organ, basically, it, for, you know, hoping not to get demonetized. But that's what it is. Um, the, the mushrooms come up, and the, the point of a mushroom is to spread spores. Spores are kind of like seeds, except very tiny and usually either spread through the air or... I, although, then again, I mean, they're, they're spread in, in a lot of the same ways as seeds. So, um, basically, the, the mushroom will release the spores one way or another. The spores get carried to a new area, and then they germinate. And out from these little spores come hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little individual filaments called hyphae. Um, the collection of hyphae, um, uh, the yeah, the, the collection of hyphae is called mycelium. And when you have mycelium from two different spores that are compatible sexually, 
uh, assuming that it's a, a sexual species, because not all of them are. Some of them are, are asexual and can just make mushrooms on their own. But, but a lot of them are require a, a, a companion. Um, so when, when the mycelium from two compatible uh, spore like strain or entities, organisms, it's, it's, it's you know, whatever. Um, when, they, when they touch, if they're compatible, it will actually fuse. So when you have hyphae and, and mycelium from a spore, it tends to be haploid, which means it has uh, one copy of DNA. Whereas when the, the mycelium meet and touch, it becomes diploid. Like they, it actually fuses together. Like the two cells fuse together, become diploid, and then they're actually able to make the mushrooms. So at that point, they'll start producing when the conditions are right, because mushrooms will are very, very sensitive to the conditions of the environment. And so they'll wait. Like they'll, they'll wait until usually just after the rain is a really good time to go looking for mushrooms because that's it's it's very damp, it's very moist, which is what they like. Um, at this point, they'll they'll form a primordia, which is sort of like a a pre mushroom, and which will grow into the fruiting body, which is the the mushroom, and then the cycle repeats where it will release more spores and then they spread and blah 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 blah. So that's the basic mushroom uh, life cycle, but most of a fungus's life is not a mushroom. The vast majority of it is living underground uh, or in wood or wherever it is that it, it that species likes to live rather than the, the fungi or, or rather the mushrooms that you see. So like I say, it's all about hyphae. This is sort of what it, uh, this is sort of what it looks like where you can sometimes if you're if you ever have mulch and you especially after it rains, if you flip the mulch over, a lot of the time you'll lo- see what looks like sort of white, roots or hairs covering the bottom of the the fresh mulch and that's actually that's mycelium that's that's fungi digesting that wood and turning it into nutrients for other things to enjoy and when you look at it under a microscope it can have all kinds of different structures there's also lots of little microscopic structures that can be sort of sticking off of uh, the mycelium and the hyphae but we're not going to get too much into that because that gets really too much into the weeds, not really what we're talking about today. But to give a a really good uh, idea of just how much the mushroom is really the mycelium and not the mushroom, we have fairy rings. So fairy rings are... Oh, somebody donated. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. Um, Let's see if I can make this a little bigger so I can read your comment better. Um... So, Mr. Lately um, says, I'm currently in week four of... Oh, <laughs> okay. You're, you're, having, you're having some fun with some fungi, I see. That's, that's cool. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, there's not actually, not actually a question. Well, anyway, thank you for donating. Greatly appreciate it. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, so back to, back to fairy rings. So... The, the vast majority of the mass of this fungus is actually in the central part under the ground. But what will happen is when those mycelium, like the, the two hyphae meet and then start spreading, it'll sort of spread out evenly and will put out mushrooms progressively uh, in a ring around where that central spot sort of was. Uh, like I say, most of the mushroom is living underground. But a fairy ring is just sort of the ring of, of fruiting bodies that you see above the ground. Now, I forget where this is from, but a, uh, a friend told it to me. And it was basically in some sort of, like, fantasy setting. It was a conversation between, you know, somebody and the, you know, the head of the fairies, right? Because there's there was this idea that fairy rings are a portal to the fae realm, which, I mean, obviously they're not. But in, in this fantasy setting, it was. And they, they're asking the fairy king, like, you know, why do you... Why do you put the portals there? And he just goes, no, I don't, I don't put the portals there. That, the mushrooms make that decision. Have you tried talking to them? They're, inco- they're incoherent. You can't reason with them. They just do their own thing. And, I mean, it's, it's not unrealistic. Like, working, working with mushrooms, they, they sort of they do, they just do their own thing. Like, a lot of growing them is just kind of getting out of their way. <laughs> 
Uh, oh, we got a we got a comment uh, or a question from Zachariah Stovall. Thank you for donating. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, what's the best bachelor's degree to get into if I want to get into genetics? Now that really depends on what kind of genetics you want to do. Uh, if you want to, if you just go into a degree that's called genetics, uh, they will almost certainly just uh, teach you population genetics and genomics and f- stuff. I find immensely boring. Um, if you want to do the stuff that I do, the thing you're looking for is called synthetic biology. Um, molecular biology, biochemistry, also very good options. Um, but synthetic biology is more what I do, where you, you know, are optimizing a thing to do work for you. It's, it's like, it's genetic engineering, where you're actually, like, attempting a goal rather than just studying how genes flow through a population. Anyway, uh, so yeah, fungi, fairy rings, very cool. Some, and I, I know we said I wasn't going to talk too much about weird modifications to hyphae, but this one I always love highlighting because it's really cool. It's that some some fungal species actually hunt. So what you're looking at is a... I, I forget the, the proper name for it, but it's, it's basically like a, a tripwire. So the thing that they're hunting is not like deer. It's, it's nematodes. So nematodes are very, very tiny animals. They're little tiny worms that have, you know, a brain and a heart. You know, they're little animals. And what the hyphae do is they grow these inflatable rings. So what happens is as the, you know, the worm is, is wiggling along, if it, if it happens to accidentally swim through one of the loops, the loop will cinch tight, uh, by inflating, you can see that there's three bladders. So it'll inflate the bladders, trap the, the nematode, and then, um, digest it. Like they'll, it'll, uh, some of them will release a toxin to, to kill the nematode and then digest it. And the reason they do this is because, at the end of the day, fungi are decomposers. You know, they need nitrogen, they need carbon, they need to eat, just like everything else. And nematodes can grow in enormous abundance in soil. Like, most soil contains many, many species of nematode. And so they're a great source of, of nitrogen. So... Because nitrogen is one of those things that tends to be very limiting in soil. It's one of the reasons why we have to apply fertilizer to plants. Because nitrogen, there's lots in the air, but it's a very stable molecule. So getting it into a chemical that can be absorbed is really tricky. So since fungi don't usually have the ability to fix nitrogen because they, they, they're, they're eaters, they're not producers, um, they'll, they'll go hunting. You know, uh, A nematode is a great source of nitrogen, and then once the nematode dies and is absorbed, it will spread those nutrients through the entire body of the fungus. One of the largest organisms in the world is actually a fungus. And my professor, uh, you know, like I say, I find pure genetics to be immensely boring. But to my professor's credit, uh, he was on the team that discovered this organism. And they realized after taking samples of this species, this, these mushrooms throughout this whole giant, I think it's a three kilometer wide area of forest. They realized that every single mushroom that they were sampling was genetically identical to the point where they realized it's all just one giant fungus, all one massive, massive living organism. And especially in the context uh, when we, which we'll get to in a moment of electrical potentials in fungi, you got to wonder if, if these things can think that's a three kilometer wide brain. What do they think about? I don't know. It's pretty cool. Um, all right. Uh, we, we got another donation, so I'm going to take a quick second to answer the question. We got from Tatiana. Thank you, Tatiana. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for donating. It says, let's say hypothetically you want to produce insulin. Uh, what fungi or other organism would you want to modify for that purpose? Um, I mean, in the context of a SHGF situation, uh, most likely you will die, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but if you had to make insulin recombinantly and somehow had DNA printing technology, but not insulin for some reason, E. coli is, is really convenient. Um, yeast, also pretty good. The problem with producing insulin is not making the insulin. The problem with producing insulin is extracting the insulin from whatever organism you're growing it in uh, and getting it to a purity that is viable for use in humans. Because, you know, unsurprisingly, injecting stuff into humans is generally quite dangerous. But yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. It's not an easy thing to do. The open insulin people have been trying it for a very long time. Um, but it's it's easy to do industrially. It's not an easy thing to do on your own, unfortunately. Alrighty, back to our fungi friends. 
fungus thoughts. Okay, so now now the, on the topic of a 3.4 kilometer wide brain or a theoretical brain, let's talk about thinking in fungus. Do fungi dream of electric trees? So what, something I haven't mentioned yet is that a lot of fungi exist in symbiosis with the plants that are growing above them. So a lot of fungi will actually, and, and plants are have evolved to interact with fungi. So the mycelium will actually penetrate into the root cells of various plant species, and the plant will basically trade uh, phosphorus for carbon. So plants are very good at absorbing lots and lots of carbon dioxide and turning it into sugars. So the plant will pump sugars down into the roots, which the fungi can then absorb, and in exchange, the fungi will pump phosphate, because fungi are very good at actually eating rocks where the phosphates are. So the fungi will pump phosphate into the plant roots, and then there's that mutual uh, sharing. But once this connection is set up, all sorts of other things can end up getting passed through this connection. So there's some papers which, unfortunately, I don't have, I didn't think to include this when I was making the presentation, but there are some, uh, some research that different plants are actually able to communicate through this connection via the fungus. So the fungus acts sort of like a plant internet, a, a planter net, I don't know, uh, <laughs> but it, it sort of acts like a plant internet where uh, a tree can send signal molecules through the fungus to neighboring plants to warn them of predators or, or infection or, or whatever it is that needs to be warned. So yeah, it's, it's really fascinating. But if fungi are capable of any kind of thought, this also means that they're capable of maybe interpreting the thoughts of plants. I don't know. Who knows? It's very weird. But importantly, fungi produce electrical activity and not like a small amount, like a really significant amount of electrical activity. And you can just measure it. Like this is not this is not even a particularly difficult thing to do. You basically just stick a bunch of electrodes into either uh, you know lab grown fungus, or you can just wander around until you find a mushroom, stick some electrodes in it, and you'll pick up all kinds of electrical activity coming off of the fungus. And if you analyze it, you can find all, out all kinds of interesting things. And there and so all of these images are taken from a bunch of different papers, all of which I'll link below after the stream, and. Many, many different researchers have found that fungi produce electrical activity that looks a whole lot like the electrical activity we expect out of neurons. And you'll see just how similar that appears in just a moment. So here's some recordings from uh, fungi. And you can see that there's sort of two general things that's going on. There's very short impulses. Um... <laughs> Uh, Nico just den or gener uh, donated. Thank you, Nico. Greatly appreciated. And yes, they are quite fun guys. <laughs> but anyway, so in terms of electrical activity, you'll see that there's basically two types, right? There's extremely short uh, spikes, which are the most reminiscent of a action potential of neurons, which again, I'll, I'll show a comparison in that, of that in a second. And then there's sort of the more general... The, the voltage just kind of climbs to a level and then holds there and then goes down. But even when the level is elevated, you can still be getting, you know, spike activity during this uh, sort of process. And if you zoom right in on one of the spikes, you can see that there's a very sharp initial increase in voltage and then it falls off to below where it started and then it drifts back up to its starting point, which is essentially identical to what you see in neurons. The The biggest difference, though, is the amount of time that this takes. Like, sometimes it can take longer, sometimes it can take shorter. But generally, it's on the same sort of order as normal neuron activity, which, again, is very weird considering this is in a fungus. <laughs> like, it looks like neuron activity. Like... The more I've been learning about the neurons and, and getting ready for the neuron project, and we'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit, the weirder looking at this is. Like, if a, if you show this to a neuroscientist, they like, I'm sure they'd probably be trying to, you know, or maybe a psychiatrist, I don't know. It's a neuropsychiatrist, you know, they're trying to diagnose what disorder the, the fungus has, you know. Maybe it's got depression. Maybe it's just high. I don't know. 
But either way, it's very, very strange seeing something that looks exactly like neural activity in a fungus. And not just like a specific fungus, like a lot of species of fungus, the vast majority. And you can find that the electrical activity varies between species, where some are much spikier, like they just produce lots and lots of spikes, whereas some are, are much more chill. Which again, is weird. These are fungus. Like, what the hell? Um, and yeah, what if, what if neurons are fungus? So something that you'll see in a moment is the mechanism that allows this is very, very ancient to the point where it seems to be in most species. And, and I'll show you an example of that later. But the ability to send and receive electrical activity in networked organisms seems not quite fundamental, but it, it does seem very ancient which is odd, but, you know, it, it is there, uh, which, is, which is strange. So, like I said, for comparison, these are human neurons. Notice how it looks exactly the same? <laughs> like, disturbingly so? Like, yeah, you know, there's some variation, but it's a lot of, like, spikety, 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 spike. Um, with, with human neurons, it tends to be a little more flat, like, the, the base voltage doesn't vary as much, but again, that really depends on your recording time. Like, if you're recording over a long enough time, you can see that drift up and down. It depends what type of neural tissue you're recording from. But, I mean, if there's just sort of a general voltage swing in fungi, if you remove that, you just get basically spikes that look exactly like this, which, again, is immensely, immensely strange. So... The next question is, okay, well, if they're doing neural activity, do they think? Do they respond to stimuli? Do they, what, you know, what, is it just random or are they actually doing something with it? And yeah, no, it, they seem to be communicating at least a little. So, for example, what they did was they basically took a, a block of uh, mushrooms and they, they stuck some probes in, in different mushrooms and they basically just held a lighter to, to one of the, uh, one of the mushrooms. And you can see that almost immediately there's a, a noticeable spike in a nearby mushroom. So the damaged mushroom immediately sends out signals which are interpreted by the other uh, mushrooms as something has happened, which is wild. Um, we, had a, we had a donation, so... Uh, <laughs> C'est la vie. Thank you. Thank you. Greatly appreciated. It says, could you connect neurons to fungi? I mean, Maybe. We'll, we'll get to that. I actually, I've, I've, been, I've had some thoughts on this, but we'll, we'll get there later. Um, I think one of the, the, the differences, but I mean, even then, I was going to say that, you know, one of the differences is the precise voltage that you get out of fungi versus neurons. But like, let's be honest, it's not that different. Like, it's about, you know, 20 to 30 millivolts. It's, it's very similar between them. So, yeah, probably. Um, it would be very interesting to have a fungus feeding info to a neuron array and seeing what it does. I don't know if it would do anything interesting, but it'd be pretty cool because then you could dream fungus thoughts. And I mean, that sounds, well, dangerous mostly. <laughs> but anyway, so fungi do respond to stimuli and they send, when, when something happens to one part of the fungus, it sends a stimulus to the rest of the fungus to let it know that something's going on. So this is the experiment I was talking about before. And you can see that they've got wires in different fungi that are, are um, further and further apart. And the, are the, so they're stimulating the ones that are labeled, you know, S, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And they're recording from the ones that say channel 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. So you can see that when they stimulate one of the, the fungi, you actually get activity happening in, in some of the other channels. To the like even channels that are further away, so it's it's pretty it's pretty wild. But also you can see that just recording from different mushrooms, uh, excuse me, um, the electrical activity looks very different. So sometimes you get those really sharp neuron-like spikes, but sometimes you just get these massive swings in voltage, which is which is also very odd. But you know, they're fun guys. Like, they're, that's just sort of what they do. Now, the electrical activity can actually be so detectable and so intense that 
some people have been using it to make music. So basically what they do is they, they'll stick a couple of electrodes into a mushroom that they find and then set up a whole bunch of uh, synthesizers that will take the voltage level from the fungi and then use that to drive different um, like musical notes and and you know, control like the intensity or the echo or or whatever else of the music. And then they'll they'll like futz with the do- the knobs until it sounds good. But it's very odd listening to fungi music. And I, I recommend you guys look at look this up after the stream. I, I'll actually I'll put a link to to one of them. Uh, there's an artist uh, who's been going around on TikTok and YouTube Shorts and all this kind of thing. Um, and it's it's just weird. It's lis- it's like listening to like the song of the fungus, and it's really cool. But also like a little disturbing, but really cool at the same time. So yeah, I highly recommend. And it's like good music because you know the artist messes with it till it sounds good. But still, it's I highly recommend checking it out. It's very cool. So another thing that I found very interesting is not only do fungi communicate with electricity, but they also respond to it as well. And there's a bunch of different papers that show that if you stimulate either the ground or colonized logs that have been like colonized with your your fungus of, of interest, so like in this case they're showing shiitake mushrooms, if you either directly stimulate the log or the ground nearby with high voltage electricity, so simulating lightning, basically, all of a sudden the, the fungi will fruit. So something about being shocked or or hit with high voltage electricity triggers fungi to grow, which, like, just think about how weird that is for a second. Like, partly you can think of, and you go, okay, well, I mean, that kind of makes sense because fungi are looking for sort of an after-the-rain kind of environment to grow. But why would be being hit with lightning make them grow better? Like, there, this is something just fundamentally strange and there's places that have now taken to using high voltage to like help their their mushroom farms so they'll just like electrocute the logs periodically (laughs) whenever they want them to to fruit because very shortly after the stimulation you'll end up with fruiting so it's it's very weird like they can think but it's kind of like some weird like electroshock thing i don't know maybe maybe fungi are just kinky i don't know man it's just strange but it's still very cool to see that this interaction is a thing. But yeah, let's uh, we'll, we'll keep on keeping on. All right, so the, the last thing is interpreting fungi thoughts. So if basically with all of this electrical activity, people started wondering, okay, well, could we like decode it? Oh, we had a, we had a donation. Oh, thank you, Nico. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Nico uh, Nico just writes, uh, we, we found a thing uh, that might be able to think. Let's try electroshock therapy. Science. Yeah, pretty much. That's, uh, that, that's pretty much exactly how that goes. Um, uh, somebody, un- somebody unknown says, Biotechn- uh, biotechnology if you want to get into genetic engineering. Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. That's a really good way to get into genetic engineering. Anyway, back to the back to our fungi friends. So the these researchers uh, started wondering if you could decode the language of fungi, and by language they're being really broad here. They're they're basically saying, are the spike patterns that we're seeing do they form any kind of like actual general pattern, or is it all just random noise, right? Because I mean, it could be. It could all just be random noise, and the fungi aren't actually doing anything. Although, let's be honest. If every single fungus has the same neuron-like spiking activity, it's got to be doing something with it. So it, it wouldn't be it would be silly to say that this is like some weird vestigial thing. Anytime we've said that about nature, it's always been wrong. So um, basically, what they did was they started looking at the like the patterns that show up. So they took a lot a lot of lot of recordings of the fungi and started to see if there were sort of words or syllables or basically like patterns that repeat regularly you know the sort of thing that they see over and over and over again and if they do is there any kind of flow like do you see do you always see one pattern and then another one or is it totally random or is there any kind of uh patterning to it and uh yeah no there there kind of is so when they mapped this out they found that 
So this was this is some of the uh, the graphs that they made, where basically each little circle is a specific pattern, and these graphs show the general tendency of which patterns tend to flow into which others. So for example, if you look at B, um, you'll see in the in the top it says. 20. So whatever spike pattern 20 was, you typically see that and then number 12 and then number two and then number one. And so like that's the the train of of patterns that you would see. Now, they, they haven't gotten as far as to figure out what any of this actually means. But hey, it's a step in the right direction. I mean, insofar as we can't even speak to other mammals, the fact that we're trying to figure out what fungi are doing is pretty wild. But still, it's... Uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that not only are they producing electrical activity, it's not random. Like, it's, it's patterned, and they are sending some sort of message. Now, in some of the, the papers that I'll link below, they, they, they actually talk about this. And one of the experiments that they did was they pushed a solution of salt water into the block of fungus. So that way, and then recorded the, the spike activity. And so what you see is very little spiking for a little bit, but a huge surge in, in voltage. And then after a little while, you start seeing the spikes again. And so there was a theory that maybe this is the fungi is communicating about growth state. So this is how they can coordinate when it's time to fruit or when they need to do certain things, or maybe if there's a predator or if there's a food source. You know, it's very easy to imagine if a the, the hyphal tips like the, the very ends of the hyphae, find a new dense food source that they would want to send that information back to the end of the rest of the fungus to send more resources to that area to help with the digestion and, and whatever else that they need to do. So it, it's not unreasonable to think that they're doing this electrically. Um, one of the other things which I wish I'd, I'd thought to have a gif of this, that fungi do is what's called uh, neuronal, neuronal streaming. So fungi and, and mycelium... Um, um, I'm going to finish this thought and then I'm going to ask the question. So fungi and mycelium are, they're not like individual cells per se. It's, it's just long tubes. So in a sense, and th of course this varies between fungi. I'm going to be really broad here, but in a, in a sense, a lot of fungi tend to be one big cell for a lot of their life cycle. So the nuclei are not confined to like individual cells along the length of the hyphae. They can flow freely throughout the whole tube. And so something that can happen is if the fungi encounter a new food source, if one of their nuclei has a mutation that allows them to break down that food source, uh, that nuclei will start getting copied and then send copies back through the rest of the fungus so that the entire fungus gets that ability. Um, and so it's not unreasonable to think that if this is happening, that they're also sending electrical activity, which can be interpreted further away or, or whatever the case may be. All right. So we had a, we had a question from Rob Works. Uh, did you speak on how fungi and plants work together in their own underground economy? Yes, I did. Earlier in the, uh, earlier in the show, we talked about how uh, fungi and plants will form a symbiotic relationship where the fungi will grow into the roots of the plant and they'll trade both nutrients, but then also the plants can use the fungi as sort of like a an internet of sorts, which again is immensely weird and very cool to the point where if you really think about it, like if you're walking through a forest, every, like most of the things are connected at least a little bit. Um, like all the plants are all at least a little connected through the various fungi. And something that we found is that when a, um, a tree puts out seeds the little baby plants will get end up getting connected to the 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 parent plant and if the the parent plant can decide or determines that um um if the parent plant de uh, determines that the conditions are really good it will actually force more nutrients through the roots through the fungi into the baby plants Whereas if the conditions aren't good, it will sort of withhold to basically force the little baby plants to die. Uh, so that way resources aren't wasted on offspring that just won't make it or don't stand a good chance of making it. Um, which is, I think, fascinating. Like truly, that's just immensely weird and very cool. But it's, it's all these sorts of things that we're learning about how fungi interact with the world around them and how everything else is all interconnected. And how forests are these giant 
sort of super organisms in a sense with even though there's a lot of competition between plants and, and everything else there is also a lot of cohesion and, and uh coordination and sharing of resources so you know trees are socialists <laughs> um but anyway moving on okay so now we're going to take a brief interlude and talk about neurons because we're, we're talking about electrical activity we're talking about um uh you know the thoughts of fungus. So let's talk about the thoughts of meat. So in a previous video, you've seen these before. If you've been a long time viewer of the channel, these are our first attempt at making neuron arrays. So basically the idea is it's a little culture dish with lots of little electrodes that go into the culture dish with neurons growing in a sheet on top. And as the neurons put out little spikes, you can interact with them by either feeding in signals or just listening to all their, their little spikies. And you can do all kinds of very interesting things with them. I've, I've wanted to make them pass butter because I, you know, am in it for the meme. Um, and also just because I think it's funny. Uh, we're thinking about making it play Doom. It'll be a good time. I, I, if you haven't subscribed already, you should definitely subscribe to watch us make neurons play Doom. Like that's, I don't even think I need to upsell that, honestly. <laughs> um, but this is the exciting update. These are our brand new neuron arrays that have just arrived. They're, they're prototypes and they, they still need a little bit of work. Uh, this array was designed by our new team member, Jonah. I think he did a really fantastic job. These look great. Uh, they were ordered just from like a traditional PCB manufacturer, and you're going to be seeing these in a video soon. But one of the things I was thinking about when these when these arrived was, yes, of course, we're, we're making them for listening to neurons and recording neurons. But there's nothing to say that we couldn't use these arrays for recording from fungi or slime mold or, or any of the, the other things that put out electrical signals. And so I think there might be some interesting stuff there where not only are we going to be able to, or, or, or could you theoretically just, you know, stick some electrodes in a, in a mushroom, you might be able to do this on a really micro scale. So maybe you just grow like some mold or some maybe yeast, maybe yeast do it. I don't know. Um, but if we, with these arrays in hand, in hand, not only could we record from neurons, but we, re, we could record from fungi as well, which I think could be really cool. Um, but yeah, the, the Neuron Project is happily moving along. I've now ordered the Neuron Media. I'll be ordering neurons this week. I'm very excited. So that, that video, those that series of videos is going to start coming out pretty soon, probably in the next two months. So if you haven't subscribed, definitely do that. And also, this is why there's a donation bar in the bottom, because Neuron Media is very expensive, um, <laughs> as is this whole project. Um, you know, just the, uh, just the head stage... Not, not even the rest of the electronics, but just the actual amplifier stage required to work with this neuron array is like almost a thousand dollars. So, you know, it's, it's a big project. We're breaking it up into little pieces so that way we can both stand the highest chance of success, cover the most ground, do the most things with it, but also, you know, spread those costs a little thin because, yeah, it's a lot of money. Unsurprisingly, growing brain sheets is uh, not cheap. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Um, but yeah, once we have these, now that people are suggesting it, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll try feeding in some, some funky, funky thoughts into the neurons and see what that does. Cause you know, that'll only be the, the second weirdest thing we'll do all year. So anyway, that's, that, that's sort of that, I, you know, I, I digress. This is, I'm really excited for this project. It's why I wanted to talk about it quickly, but it also has uses outside of just neurons, which I think would be very cool. Okay. Back to fungi. Okay, so the theme of today was not do, well, I mean, the, the title of the video says do fungi think, but the, the original idea was could you see the thoughts of fungus? Uh, ooh, we had a donation. Uh, Devic, thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. Uh, anyway, so um, we, wanna, we don't want to just see the thoughts in the sense of like, you know, you've taken electrical recording, because I mean, there's no genetic engineering in that. That's just sticking an electrode to mushroom. We want to see the thoughts, you know, like physically. So we're going to take a trick from neuroscience. And so what you're looking at here is a zebrafish brain that has been genetically modified with a protein called G-CAMP. Uh, I think this one was G-CAMP 6. But there's, there's a whole series of them. Basically, what they've done is they've taken green fluorescent protein uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a green fluorescent protein. And they took another protein called calmodulin. So calmodulin is a calcium binding protein that exists in the brain. And they basically took calmodulin and they split it in half. 
and they put it on either end of a green fluorescent protein. And they did it in such a way that the only time that the whole thing becomes fluorescent is when calcium levels are high. So when calcium levels are high, the, the calmodulin pieces bend back on themselves and connect, and that drags the two chunks of green fluorescent protein into the correct alignment, and it will suddenly become fluorescent. So basically what you're looking at is every time a neuron fires, one of the things that happens is there's this huge wave of calcium that's released because one of the ions that flows when neurons fire is calcium. And so using this calcium-sensitive fluorescent protein, you're able to actually see when the neurons fire. Oh, we had a couple of donations. Uh, Ismi asks, can you explain why the electrode nodes are shaded like they are, the terminals? Okay, I'll just go back to the thing really quickly. Um, so they're, they're shaded just because it's weird lighting um, from the overhead microscope. Um, just a, a quick word on this. Basically, the way this is going to work is we're going to put a coating over this whole area. The, the reason that the manufacturer didn't just do this for us is because they don't have a punch to make small enough and precise enough holes in the coverlay. So they basically just cut a big hole out of the coverlay and just gold plated everything else. So what we're gonna have to do is put a layer of epoxy down and then ablate using a fiber laser just the little ends of the electrodes. So that way we're recording from little very sharp areas instead of that whole trace. Cause obviously an, un an uncovered trace is just gonna record from the whole thing, which is useless. So anyway, that's that's a little bit about that. Um, anyway, back to back to our fungus thoughts. Oh, Jason, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. And, and Matt B. Also, thank you very much, guys. Very, very, very much appreciate it. Um, all right, so back to seeing fungus thoughts. So if, the, if you could do this to a brain, you know, I got wondering, could you do this to other things? And, um, you know, yeah, pretty much, you can. Um, so again, here's another example of some neurons where they've been modified with G-Camp. Um, we're actually going to be doing this at some point. Um, if we're growing neurons, one of the things that we're going to be doing is genetically modifying the neurons. And G-Camp is, I actually have the code for it now. Um, I, I have a bacteria that produces uh, G-Camp 6. And it doesn't work great in the bacteria because I, I basically put too much of it. So the, the, the trouble with this, and you can actually see this in this image, where theoretically the protein is supposed to light up only when the calcium level is high, but if... It's, one, it's sort of a matter of statistics, right? Statistically, some of the proteins, like there's a, enough background level of calcium that some of the protein is always going to be in the fluorescent state. And so you can see it in, the, in the, the GIF on the left where most of the neurons are already glowing, but you'll get a bright flash from some that have sort of a better, a better balance or when they fire. And so basically what happened when I tried expressing G-Camp in bacteria they're just always glowing. Like you don't, you don't see the, the swing up and down of, of bright and then dim and then bright and then dim, um, even though they're supposed to do that. And this is what I was talking about earlier where the mechanism for allowing for neuronal-like activity is very, very old. Um, so if you look at here, here's two different examples of things where we've put G-Camp into and you can see them light up and do kind of thought-like behavior. So on the right, you can actually see um, E. coli that have been expressed, that are expressing G-Camp. And if you look carefully, you'll see that some of the cells light up periodically over time. So, you know, they'll, they'll light up for a second and then they, they, they go away. So what's happening there is you're having a huge influx of calcium into the cell and then it's pumping it all out. And so the, the protein will go from fluorescent to unfluorescent. And if this happens in E. coli, of all things, um, then it stands to reason that this is a very, very ancient mechanism. Because if it's happening in E. coli, and it's happening in fungi, and it's happening in humans and every other animal, this must be a very ancient mechanism. Although when you think about it, in, in the context of E. coli specifically, and bacteria generally, this could be a mechanism for how the microbiome like all the bacteria that live in your gut and in your and on in your body could be interacting with you because if they're able to produce these these intense electrical impulses there's nothing to say that your neurons can't be picking it up so there's a chance that the bacteria that are living in your gut are interacting and sending you signals and literally controlling you a little bit um electrically which is really wild 
Um, we had a couple of donations, so I just want to address those really quickly. Um, uh, where, where'd they go? Um, ah, Luma, uh, Lauma, uh, tipped. Thank you very much. Uh, greatly appreciated. And somebody anonymous tipped. And again, thank you very much. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you guys. Um, anyway, so yeah, your, if your microbiome is thinking, um, and sending you electrical signals, like that's pretty weird. Um, whether or not it's, it's really to that extent is hard to say, because I mean, if you're looking at those E. coli, like they're not doing any, like it's, it's, it, it seems pretty random, but then again, it, this is a pretty niche thing. Like Gcamp is a fairly new tool and it's mostly been applied to neurons. So I think as more people start to study the microbiome and the interactions there, you'll find probably more instances of, of stuff like this. But if it works in bacteria, like that's pretty cool. On the left, what you're seeing is a venus flytrap. So a venus flytrap, uh, for those that don't know, is a carnivorous plant. And when the, the, the trap is, is actually a modified leaf, it exists in an open state and it has three little trigger hairs on each half of the, the trap. When the first hair is triggered, the, the, at the base of the, the hair is sort of a sack filled with calcium. So when you deform the hair, it releases this burst of calcium. And so that's what you're, you can actually see that happening in the video on the left, where when that when the hair is first stimulated, the whole thing suddenly lights up and you can actually see it propagate out from where that hair is, where the entire trap will light up but the trap doesn't close at that point. The way that a trap works is it actually is requiring an even higher level of calcium. So this way, it's basically avoiding accidentally being triggered when, say, debris or the wind or something bumps one of the hairs. Because the it's it takes a lot of energy for the leaf to close. And it's, it, you know, as with all things, plants need to be very efficient. They don't have a lot of energy to spare. And if you actually section the Venus flytrap leaves, what's really interesting about them is they are packed full of fat and lipids um, because they need to store enormous amounts of energy both to power the trap closing and also to produce all of the digestive enzymes that ends up eating the thing. But anyway, so when the trigger hair is triggered a second time, it puts out a second wave of calcium, and you can actually see that where the whole trap lights up even brighter, and only that at that point does the trap close. So it's very interesting that even if the plant isn't thinking, you can still get a automated response, like a, a, an in, intrinsically programmed response, simply using calcium signaling and just a wave of calcium. So it's it's not that strange to think that lots of other things are probably doing this. And there's some other videos which I didn't include in the presentation, but we'll probably talk about in a future stream at some point, where if you wound a, a plant, you can actually see like a wave of calcium come out. So like if you, if you were to take the same Venus flytrap and then chop one of the traps off, you'll see this wave of calcium transmitting down the, the I, I, don't, I guess it's a stem, uh, but like sort of the base of the leaf. And then you'll see some of the other leaves light up in response. The whole plant is suddenly aware that damage has happened and will actually start undergoing genetic processes to try and deal with that damage. Uh, if plants detect that they're being chewed on, for example, like if a, if a caterpillar is chewing on a plant, it'll send out the wave of calcium and that's one of the signals that the plant will recognize of, oh no, I'm being chewed on. And then a series of things will happen where it'll put out chemicals into the air to warn other plants of predators. And when the other plants detect those signals, they'll start producing bitter chemicals to help pre uh, basically prevent pre predation. So that way when the caterpillar ends up on that plant, maybe they bite into it and go, ew, no, this is gross. I'm going to go to a different one. So if you have ever smelled the smell of cut grass, which I think most of us have, that's what that is. You're, you're hearing plants screaming, or, well, you're smelling plants screaming. So, yeah, anybody who loves the smell of cut grass, now you get to think about that. Enjoy. <laughs> you know, the, you know, watch the, you know, very, very nervous vegans in the comments. But, uh, no, seriously, it's, 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 but it's weird to think of, even though they, like, a plant doesn't have a brain, it can still sense and communicate and do a lot of the things we think of, even if it's doing it basically automatically, which is very strange. Uh, we got a question uh, from Cole. Uh, 
Uh, Cole, thank you for donating. Greatly appreciated. Would you be able to use GCAMP to look for horizontal gene transfer in microbiomes under distress? I don't think that that's the way that you would want to look for horizontal gene transfer. Um, you're really going to want to look for, well, the, the genes. It'd be much easier to just sequence and, and see if genes have moved that way. Because GCAMP is only going to show you if they can do calcium signaling. And if E. coli can do it, it's, it's not that special. You'd want to actually sequence the organism to see what it's doing to allow that calcium. Like you'd want to look at, say, the, the calcium channels and see if they are genetically similar to, say, the human ones or, or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, anyway, so moving on. So now the big question, does this work in fungi? And oh boy, yes, it does. So what you're looking at is, I believe this is, um, oh, I had it written down. Which one was it? Um, I think it's a it, it's a species of Aspergillus. So it's a this is a mold, um, not even like a not even a, a mushroom forming fungus. This is just a normal mold, and this has been modified with GCAMP just like the others. And sure enough, you can see it lighting up and doing all kinds of weird calcium signaling, even though it's just a tiny little speck of mold. So I think this is fascinating, just utterly, absolutely fascinating. And I really think that more fungi need to be modified this way and add that to the tool set of figuring out fungal neural computation or whatever it is that they're doing. Because I, I think this is fascinating. And also I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a visual boy. I like being able to see the stuff. Like, you know, a chart is lovely, but you know, it's one of those things it, what's the what's the phrase? Um I think it's red zips aloquiter, like the thing speaks for itself. You know, it's, it's one thing to stick an electrode into a fungi and go, look, it's thinking. And it's a very different thing to like modify a whole fungus and see it thinking. And so this is basically the mod that we're going to be engineering today. So I think without further ado, it's coding time. Who's excited? Okay, before we get into before we get into coding time, let's. I'm gonna take like two seconds, just have a look at the comments, see how everybody's doing. How's everybody enjoying the uh, the stream so far? Everybody having a good time? Ah, sorry, I was also very thirsty. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, somebody mentioned slime molds. Slime molds are even weirder. Like, if, if fungi are immensely weird, slime mold is weird times a thousand. Because slime molds are just one gigantic cell. Like, it's it's actually an amoeba, which is weird, but it can, like, solve mazes. We have one at the lab. Its name is Jerry. There's going to be a video about Jerry very soon. Uh, and uh, it's been profoundly weird. It has been profoundly, profoundly weird growing Jerry and seeing it like solve mazes and be really picky about its food. And like, I think it has a sense of smell. Like it, it, it when I say it solves mazes, it doesn't, it doesn't just like solve a maze. It solves a maze uncannily well, like, like disturbingly so. And we're going to have to do a bunch of trials to sort of prove this, but it seems at least at the basics it, it has a pretty significant sense of smell which is weird for a giant single celled amoeba um so yeah uh, jerry is immensely weird and you'll see that in a in a future video but all right let's uh let's 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 do some code um okay so it is code time all right so the the fungi that we're gonna be looking at modifying today is oyster mushrooms, mostly because they're, I mean, not that we're, I don't actually intend, to, to be clear, I don't actually intend on doing this necessarily. I might, but I, I don't really intend on doing this. It's, it's more of just, uh, like all, all of the Who's Gene episodes, a lot of the fun is just learning how you would program something like this rather than actually doing it. Because as soon as you go from writing code on a computer to trying to mess with the DNA in purpose, in person, I should say, it gets very expensive very quickly and working with like growing oyster mushrooms, very easy. Genetically modifying oyster mushrooms, less so. Um, so, you know, it can get a little bit, nah. But anyway, so the way that we're going to do this is based off of this paper. Uh, so it says yield improvement in the king oyster mushroom. Uh, oh, so I, strictly speaking, it's king oyster. So just, just for you can see it. It is a different species. So king oyster are these are the the fat boys. They're they're very very cute. 
um, gigantic chunks. And I mean, they make really good stir fry. Like you can cut them like up like scallops. They make they're really good. You know, you can if you get a big enough one, you can fry them up like steaks. They're really good. Highly recommend. This has nothing to do with genetic engineering. It's just a food fact. Uh, I recommend eating these. They're delicious. Um, but anyway, so king oyster, not oyster, whatever, same difference. Um, but basically the way that they did this was they took, so here's the, here's the plasmid that they designed. And so this is P. cambia 1301, which is normally a plant. Like this is normally a plant plasmid. Like I, it's very weird to see somebody using this for fungus. But I mean, if it works, it works, you know? But so basically what they did was P. cambia has a couple things of interest. Basically a lot of crap and a hygromycin resistance gene. And then the stuff for doing agrobacterium mediated transfection, which I'll talk about in a second. But hygromycin is a really gnarly antibiotic. It kind of is more poison than antibiotic, if we're being honest, because it, it kills most things. I think you can use I think you can use hygromycin for mammalian selection as well, which to me that then it's just poison. Um, but it's a poison that you can there's a gene to fix essentially. So what they did was you can see here, and I'll, I'll actually zoom in on this a little bit so you can you can see it better. Um, so this bit here, this this first arrow, arrow is the promoter. Um, so this is we've if you so before before I get too much into this if. Genetic engineering is new to you. I would highly recommend watching the last couple of streams that we did in the Learn Genetic Engineering series, where we talk in detail about what is a promoter, what are codons, how does all this work. So that way, this is less of a foreign language. Like you'll you'll actually be able to understand what I'm talking about a little better. But the long the the, the short version is a promoter is basically the start of a gene. So it, it kind of is where the machinery that that gets the process going will bind to and it also it has a lot of control elements built into it a lot of the time so like it'll only turn on under certain circumstances be that a specific point in the life cycle of the organism or when certain chemicals are applied or stimuli or whatever so in this case they're using one that's called CAMV35 uh, 35S which is the cauliflower mosaic virus 35S promoter it's a viral promoter taken out of cauliflower mosaic virus, as the name implies. And it's, I mean, it works in basically every species of plant. It's a very common plant promoter. It's pretty aggressive too. But insofar as we're dealing with fungus, it's not going to work. So what you can see that they've done is the first thing that they did was they replaced the uh, CAMV promoter for the hygromycin resistance right here with the LEGPD, which is um, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase, I should say. Glycer yeah, so glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase is a enzyme that is crucial to the citric acid cycle, which is sort of one of the main chunks of metabolism. So like when, you, when you're going from, I need to turn sugar or protein or whatever into energy that the cell can use, the citric acid cycle is the engine that sort of does that. And glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase is one of the enzymes that is part of that cycle. So this means that it's produced generally in very high level because, I mean, eating is 90% of what a, a cell does at any one moment because um, it needs to constantly be making energy or it will stop and die. So um, it's, a, it's an enzyme that's produced very readily, which means that the promoter that drives that gene is also going to be very strong. And it's, it's pretty ubiquitous. So LE stands for l -E Um I probably mispronounced that, but I don't care. And which is basically, they're shiitake mushrooms. So, so what they're saying is they took the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate de dehydrogenase promoter from shiitake mushrooms. They stuck it into this plasmid to replace the hygromycin resistance promoter. And then they st stuck a second copy facing the opposite direction, driving their gene of interest, which in this case was a, a cellulase gene. So basically what they were hoping to do was you are, they're, they're trying to make oyster mushrooms that are better at breaking down cellulose and grow faster, essentially is what they were trying to do. And so 
this is not what we're going to try and do. We want to, we're, but we're going to do something very similar. So we're going to have to replace the hygromycin promoter with the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase promoter. And then we're going to replace, uh, so in here you can see there's CMV, GUS, and then some other junk. We don't want GUS. This is a, it's a plant thing. We're not dealing with GUS today. And so all, we're going to just cut all of this out, essentially, and replace it d like entirely with the fungal gene that we want. So let, let me just show you where I got some of these pieces. So I, I just Googled P. cambia uh, 1301, and this came up. Uh, SnapGene is a really great resource for finding uh, DNA code. Um, a lot of the basic backbones are, are readily available there, so I, I highly recommend it. Um, so, you know, it gives you a nice little overview. You can, you know, mouse over all the stuff, see all the thing. But more importantly, you can just hit download and then just download the plasmid. I've already done this. Um, you'll see that in a second. And then for the um, LEGPD promoter, um, I got it out of this paper, which I'll scroll up so you can see it. It says construction of a heat-resistant strain of lentis uh, len Lentinus uh, edotes by fungal heat shock protein 20 overexpression. So basically, this is they're trying to make a heat-resistant shiitake mushroom, which, again, is very interesting. Um, and apparently, it seemed to work, which is cool. But importantly, they cloned the um, LEGPD promoter out of the mushroom. So what they did was they used PCR to isolate that part of the gene, clone it out, and then they had it sequenced. And then they were nice enough to share the sequence of the promoter in the supplementary of the paper. So if you scroll all the way to the bottom, close that. If you scroll all the way to the bottom um, where you get to the supplementary, here's the supplementary material. It was the second file, uh, was just a Word document that had the, the sequence in it. So I've gone, so this is Benchling. This is the, the program we're going to be using for doing our genetic modifications today um, because it's the one we always use and it's convenient and it's free, importantly. So I, I quite like it. And so I've already gone ahead and done all of this. Like I've, I've loaded all of this stuff in here just so we're ready so I don't have to spend, you know, 20 minutes digging around for it. But so we've got P. cambia here which is exactly what we saw before. And now that it's in Benchling, it's explorable. We can modify it. We can do whatever we want to it. So, you know, if you want to really, like, zoom in on something, you can. Um, not, not that we need to. Let's zoom back out. Uh, my head is in the way, so I'm going to just make my head a little smaller. Tiny head! Yeah, so I'm... My, my head is not very tiny. So, anyway, hopefully that'll help you... Uh, see the see the thing a little better um and anyway so we've got our p cambia ready to go uh i've already loaded in the promoter it, that's right here um and i have a copy of the plasmid that has g camp in it already um i've already made this uh well so the I have, a, I have a very similar version of this in my freezer, which is where this code came from, but we're going we're gonna to kind of work through this. So before we do anything, I think the, th the first thing that we should do is put the promoter in its place, like where it's going to go. So if we look at P. cambia, go back over here, and we're, we're, looking, at, uh, we're looking at P. cambia here. Uh, also, I should probably have done that a while ago, give us a little more room. Um, I'm going to close our, our project folder so that way, you know, we've got a little more room to work. Um, if we, if, like I say, if we're looking at Pcambia here, the hygromycin gene is right here. So if you click it, it just, it's, it's highlighted. Um, one of the things you'll notice, though, is the direction of the arrow, right? So if you look at Gus, it's point, the, the, the pointy bit of, of Gus is clockwise. So like it's, it's pointing clockwise. Um, that means the the direction that that gene is written is clockwise as well, whereas all of this is counterclockwise, which I freaking hate when people code like this. It's very annoying. It's a, it's a really good way of of isolating genes to make sure that you don't have like crosstalk, um, but it it makes just handling it in the in the software really annoying. Um, because I you know I I like to so if we look at this one right, you can see cauliflower movea, uh, whatever the the cam promoter um, generally should be on top of the, the thing. So you, if you're scrolling through all the code, you can like just scroll down. Unfortunately, this is indexed funny. 
Um, but I can fix that. So I can just go re-index. Ta-da! Okay, cool. So now you can see what I mean. So like you see promoter, and then if you just go down, you see the thing that it's actually driving, which is Gus in this case. Um, we're going to remove all of this, but that's okay. But now if we go back to this one, the promoter is facing the other way, the gene is facing the other way, which means that you've got to scroll up to find your, your gene. But basically what we're going to do is I'm going to not touch any of this if I can, um, because there is a restriction site right here, which is convenient. So we're going to be using that. So what we got to do is we're going to go to our promoter. And because we can't just copy this because we need, like this is, this is set up for clockwise. But if you try and like copy this, you're going to be in for a bad time. So what you got to do is go copy special reverse complement, and that will um, basically copy it backwards um, because there is no up or down on DNA. Like I, it's, I set it up for convenience one way, but I mean, the there's not an up or a down on DNA. You just work with it. Um, so basically what we're going to do is it's really a, a no fuss, no muss kind of thing. Um, the, the, it, when we would be ordering this, you, like when you're designing DNA, you're always thinking about how this would be ordered and like what you're actually going to be paying for to have made. So I'm gonna, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to select this and go command paste. And that should stick our thing in there. There it is, LEGBT2. Or GPD. Um, and uh, so we now have our promoter in here. There's also a bunch of this extra code in here, which we do not need. So I'm going to just get rid of it. It's not necessary. And there's, there's not like useful restriction sites in here that I'm deleting. So I, I don't feel bad getting rid of this. Um, but this would also just make the print cheaper because otherwise you're going to have to print all that garbage. Um, so basically now we, we have a, an MCS here, which is mu a multiple cloning site. It's basically just a chunk of code where they've put a whole bunch of restriction sites just to make it easy to handle the construct in the lab. Because if you don't have a restriction site, putting things together is just much more annoying. So now if I was going to be ordering this, the way that I would do it is I would say start with pcambia1301. Cut with ecori, and then there was one on the other end, which was uh, AAT2, right? So basically, I would say cut here and here, print the thing that I've now highlighted, and then put it in this hole, right? So that would deal with the hygromycin gene. So now we have LEGBT, GB, Jesus, um, LEGPD uh, promoter now driving hygromycin, which is great. Um, the CAMV poly A signal, I don't know if they got rid of it because it's not noted in their code, which is annoying. And this is like, so this paper was pretty old. Like this is, when was this written? Let me zoom, zoom out. This paper was written 2017. Okay. It's not that old. These people are just lazy. Okay. That's, that's fun. Um, I hate that. I, I hate when people don't label their stuff like, Guys, come on. You're supposed to be the professionals. What the fuck? Um, anyway, I, I hate this particular style of uh, displaying plasmids in papers. Um, and it, just because it, you're missing so much information. And it just makes it truly obnoxious to work with. Because, I mean, XMI is, is listed here, but it's not even in the plasmid. Right? Like, there, it's not even... It's not even here. So, like, they're pointing at a thing that's not there. This, this is what I'm talking about. This is this is the, the kind of very lazy garbage that, you know, genetic engineers will do because they think that academics are the only people who are going to read this and no one's ever going to attempt their thing, which is <sighs> endlessly frustrating. But that's okay. Anyway, so um, that mild rant aside, insofar as I have no idea what they did for their termination signal, I'm going to just leave this one. Because it's a poly A, it should be fine. Um, and if it isn't, I mean, the only way you're going to know is to test it. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, you go from there. But the implication was that they did this and it worked. So I'm going to assume that they didn't mess with this. Because in their in their paper, um, it does seem to imply that they're just, you know, cutting here. Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure if that's the, the case. I'd have to read this more carefully. 
Um, they, they might have just cut the whole chunk out and just put it in de novo, but then it doesn't say what they put on the end. So that's, that's, don't do this. If you're writing a paper, don't do this. It's just, it's bad. Um, because now I don't know, did they use the CAMV poly A or did they not? No idea. So we're just going to leave it because I don't know what they did. Um, one thing that we definitely don't want to mess with is this. It says LBTDNA repeat. So um, there's two of these. There's the LB and there's the RB over here. So if I highlight them both, you'll notice that this whole chunk gets highlighted. So what this is showing, the, the P. cambia system is based on agrobacterium. So agrobacterium is a species of bacteria that normally infects plants. And the way that it does this is once it gets into the plant, it will physically inject DNA and a, and a slew of enzymes into the plant, and it will permanently integrate that DNA into the plant's genome. This is one of the most common ways of modifying plants. It's really quick and easy. It's also a bit weird because you have to use an infectious thing to do it, and so there's some qualms there. But basically what it, what it does is it's looking for the LB and RB, and that kind of, to the agrobacterium, marks which chunk of DNA needs to be shoved into the plant genome. And so that's why those are there. So we, we definitely don't want to mess with that. It's very important we don't mess with that. But we now have our LEGB, uh, the freaking, we have the promoter and the hygromycin. So this is now going to be included and put into the fungal cells, which means that we're going to be, we would theoretically be able to select the modified cells based on hygromycin resistance. So you do the transformation, you expose the mycelium to the armed uh, agrobacterium, and then you basically just let it rip and once once you give it some time to recover then you can it would only the cells that have been modified properly will continue to grow so that's lovely now we need to deal with the actually interesting bit which is our g camp so again we're just going to come over to here um, grab our promoter again so just click on it just now we just click copy because we want it in the normal uh, orientation which is good um, instead of having to do it backwards again we're going to come over here so our multiple cloning site has now been moved. So I'm going to re-index again just because I need to be able to see the multiple cloning site um, as we're doing this. So now we can see our the promoter we want to replace here. Um, but then we see that there's kind of like this desert of nothing um, all the way up to here. All of this code is junk nonsense that we don't need. Um, there's there's nothing in here as far as I know. Like there's not there might be a regulatory element in here, but as far as I, I as far as I'm aware, this is all just spacer or lack Z, which we also don't care about. So it's pretty safe to get rid of that. So I'm just going to delete it um, if it will let me. Come on, go away. Yay, it's gone. Okay, so now we have a little a nice short path between the nearest restriction site and the thing that we want to stick in here. So what we can do is we can just grab that paste and that should stick our new promoter in so if we were going to order this we would essentially do this in a couple of pieces so the first is we would say okay you know cut with ecori and aat2 oh no okay um thus and so we'd say okay put this piece in first so that gets us our hygromycin resistance and then the second one is we'd say okay now come over to here cut with hind3 which is this guy and you could either do NCOI or you can print the whole next piece all as one chunk. So let's go over to our GCAMP. Now, this is this this particular GCAMP has been optimized for um, bacteria. So I'm going to do a little thing where we're going to see if we can fix that. So first thing, I'm going to go copy special because I don't want the DNA here. I want the actual amino sequence. Um, did we just get a did we get a donation? I just didn't notice. No. Something something moved and I, I like saw a squirrel. Um, anyway, so we're gonna go copy special and then we're gonna go copy translation because what this is gonna do is instead of copying the DNA, this is gonna copy the protein sequence, which is what we really care about. So then if we open up our, our project stuff again, um, and then I go to where where the hell do I put this? Spider McMain, Stream Projects, Fungi Thoughts, here. Um, and then we go new uh, amino acid sequence. We're going to call this GCAMP6F because that's the particular version of GCAMP we're using. And then we're going to paste that in. Pasty paste. Now, 
so this is this is our Gcamp sequence. This is the actual protein sequence. And you can actually take this and stick it into something like AlphaFold if you want to see what the um, structure of it looks like. There's actually a new feature that they've added, 3D structure, that lets you do exactly that. Um, I have a, you know, on, on our server, we have a version of AlphaFold running. So when I'm doing work like this, if I want to see what the protein looks like, or if I'm, I'm really going in and like messing with the nuts and bolts of a protein I, and I need to see what it looks like, I'll use AlphaFold for that. But for this, in this case, we're just copying code, so it doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to right click on it and click back translate. And this is going to let us convert this back into DNA, but of the species that we care about, hopefully. So let's just have a little look around and see, is there anything that looks even vaguely fungal? Um, so we have Saccharomyces, which is always good, but it's not that great. So let's just keep looking. Uh, we got Agrobacterium, which is, eh, it's not bad. Not really what we're looking for. Uh, Chlamydia minus, no, we don't want that. Um, Fusarium? No, that's that's a virus. We don't want that. Um, that's a that's a yeast. That's Lactococcus. We don't want that. Um, I think that's rice. Yeah, Orzio sativa. Um, Rhodobacter, Pseudomonas. What do we got? Anything good? I think we might be shit out of luck on this one. That's a bummer. Okay, well we're gonna use yeast because it's close enough. It's, I mean, this, this is one of the, those things where you would design this, you would try it, see if it works, and if it's not perfect, you go back in and, and mess. But for all intents and purposes, this is probably fine. So I'm going to just go with... Where's... Uh, I just saw it. Where did it go? I'm looking for... Ah, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay. So we're going to just do Saccharomyces. We're going to hit Preview Optimization. It's going to think about it for a second. And Terminomyces. Oh, did I? Was there Aspergillus and I didn't even see it? Oh, yeah, Aspergillus. I'm an idiot. Okay, well, <laughs> good catch, guys. Um, yeah, Ismay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to try that again. Aspergillus niger. So that's actually closer. So now we're actually into something like filamentous. Um, it's a mold, so it's it's not quite a, a full mushroom, but I mean it is closer, so the 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 code should overlap or their codon usage should, should be more similar. So now we're going to click preview optimization. And it's got to think about it for a second, you know, think about its life choices, design some DNA. It's a thinking. Uh, there we go. Okay, so now it's done. So now we're going to click Save as New Sequence. And we're just going to click Select because it should just automatically stick it where we want. There we go. So now it's made a, a new file, uh, GCAMP codon, codon Optimized. As always, the first thing you want to do is grab it, click, uh, right click, hit Create Annotation, and give it a name. Because if you don't, you just have unlabeled letters, and then you have no idea what they are, which is never fun. So now that we have this and it's optimized, we can just copy it. We go back to our P Cambia. And now we got to get rid of all this junk because we don't want it. So um, I'm going to leave this NCOI site because NCOI is really helpful. Um, and there's a Bigly too. Uh, so I'm also going to leave that one in. So I think, yeah, Bigly ends right there. It's BGL2. I just like calling it Bigly because it's more fun. And, you know, live a little. Um, any, any time a professor says you need to take things seriously, just, you know, laugh at them a little. Um, lean into absurdism. Anyway, um, so there's a, there's a his tag here, which we probably don't want. So I'm going to just go past that. There's a, a PMLI site here, BSDI, uh, AFL3. I'm going to go with that one. Um, there's a NOS Terminator. Don't know what that is, but again, there's, they seem to have left that in. Yeah, NOS Poly-A, they, they did leave in. So I'm not going to mess with that. Um, so if we go back to Benchling, I'm going to just hit, hold shift. Uh, B-S-T-E-I-I, -I, I think, is a normal restriction site. So I think that's fine. Um, so I'm just going to hit paste. And then it's got to think about its life choices for a second. And there we go. All right, so now we have a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase promoter driving GCAMP 6F. 
and we have the same promoter driving hydromycin. There's terminators on both, although this ter terminator is maybe a little bit sketchy. And these are now loaded and ready to go for agrobacterium. So the last thing that I'm going to do just to tidy this up is just kind of add some more restriction sites because I don't like leaving um, low levels of restriction sites because then you run into problems where you want it to do a thing and surprise, it doesn't do that thing anymore. Um, also, something I just, I just thought of. So what, something that's always good is you just go create translation um, and you just click forward. And so now it'll, it'll make a translation for you. And yeah, this is exactly what I was worried about. So you see it's, it ends on a K. That's fine, but what it's missing is a stop codon. So stop the stop codon is the last codon. It marks the end of a protein sequence. You must always have a stop codon. Otherwise, it'll just keep reading and you make junk. So the way that I like to do this is I, I'll, I'll uh, hold shift because I want capitals just so you can see it. Is, and I'll go TAA, TAG, TAA, TGA. Um, that's four stop codons. A codon is three letters. Um, I like to just include all of them because you can never have too much termination. It's one of those things where I, the number of times I've had an issue where there, there was insufficient termination and there was read through where the stupid ribosome kept reading past where it was supposed to and ju making junk protein that's the wrong size or has extra crap stuck to it is uh, too many. So <laughs> I, I, I tend to just put a lot of stop codons because it, it can't hurt and it, it's helpful. Um, anyway, so the other thing that I was going to do now that we've got our stop codons, and I'm going to just label those stop, um, is just add our, our extra restriction sites. So um, AFEI is a really good one. It's cheap. It's available. So I'm going to stick that in here. Um, so I don't want to mess with this one because this one is part of the, the backbone. So you could actually cut here for insertion. So you've already got, you got to go to the left of it so that this one's left alone. Um, so now you can paste AFEI in. Um, so now we've got uh, we've got two nice restriction sites on the end. We should have two. We've got NCOI and Bigly here. We've got like a, a just a, a load of them here. Um, and then there was uh, one here. Um, since I'm saying that we're gonna like in theory, if you're ordering this, I'd say that you want to use AAT two as your your cut site. I'm gonna stick another one in here just because it can't hurt. Um, so yeah, AVR2, AVR2 is a solid choice. So we go command copy, command paste, pasty paste, and now we've got AVR2. So now we have a, like, if you were to have this made, you'd have a whole bunch of very convenient restriction sites for, for cutting and removing any of the individual pieces. So let's say that you were, you start doing this and it's, it's working really great. You've got a bunch of Gcamp fungi. You could then replace the G-Camp with whatever you want, and now you already have a, a pre-built plasmid ready to go. So this is this would be capable of continuing to modify the fungus with whatever other mods you want. So maybe you do the cellulase thing that the other people were talking about, or add heat shock protein to make it more heat resistant, or maybe you just want it to be blue. So you just add a blue protein. Whatever whatever it is that you really want. Like, you know, if we don't we don't have coral on land, but we do have a lot of mushrooms, so Maybe you just want some blue mushrooms to, to, you know, spruce up your living room. I don't know. I don't know what you decorate with. Don't judge me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, this way you, you have the, the tool set for doing this now. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, this is the, it's, it's a nice, easy design. It, it should work pretty well. I mean, the only way to find out is, of course, to test it. Um, I've never actually done agrobacterium stuff before. Um, I know a lot of people have, but I, I just, I haven't done a lot of plant work, so I, I tend to avoid it. Also in Canada, the legislation around agrobacterium is a little bit spicy because it is infectious and it can infect pretty much any plant. The government doesn't generally like it if you have that without a license. So there's basically a bunch of stuff you got to do through Health Canada to be able to do it, which is, which is basically the main reason I haven't done agrobacterium stuff. Um, but if I ever want to do plant stuff, you just get the license, let it, let Health Canada know what you're doing, prove that you have the correct uh, biosafety protocols to make sure you're not accidentally releasing it from your lab, and then they let you do it. But anyway, 
So yeah, like I say, haven't done a lot of agrobacterium work just because I haven't been in a situation where it's been required. I tend to do bacteria, yeast, or mammalian stuff. So it's just not a tool that I've, I've had the chance to work with before. Um, but yeah, this is, this is pretty much it. So I think what we're going to do is I'm going to set this to um, just camera. Yay. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take probably five, ten minutes just to, to answer any questions and then we're gonna call for today because I think this has been I think it's been a good time. We've been on the air for about an hour and a half, which I think is great. So yeah, how uh, what do y'all what do y'all think? How do you how do you feel about the the fungus thoughts? What do you what do you think about fungus and and their weird foresty thoughts? Um, oh, actually, I think our uh, our moderator might have been saving some some questions. So I'll just uh, pull that up. If you like, uh, if you guys want to, like, if you if, if you got any questions, throw them up in the uh, in the chat, and I'll, I'll I'll answer a few before we wrap up. Um, what is this? Um. Uh, somebody says, I remember reading about physical neural networks for computing and AI models. Could you use fungi for that too? Maybe. Um, one of the papers that I'm going to link in the in the description is, I think, called Towards Fungal Computing. So it, it is that thing. It's people trying to use fungus to do computing. So, yeah, it's totally possible. Um, all righty. Let's see what we got. Um, how do they make glowing animals? And I'm not reading the rest of that question because... No. Um, so the, the way they make glowing animals is, I mean, yeah, it's you, you, you can either modify one of the gametes um, or you can clone them. So like you can modify an adult cell and then do the cloning procedure where you take the cell out and stick it into a new, or you take the nucleus out, stick it into a, an egg cell um, and, and grow it that way. Or you can, like I said, you can modify gametes. There's, there's a bunch of different ways to make glowing animals. Um, if you're doing frogs uh, or fish, you can just grab the egg and just and just you know, squirt some uh, squirt some DNA in there, and it works really surprisingly well. Um, it's the same with like ants or or insects. Like the way that you genetically modify an insect is you just take the eggs um, and micro inject them with with a DNA solution. So it's very it's it's quite straightforward to do. Um, all right, what else we got? Um, anything fun? Are humans a paras? Are are hu Humus a parasitic in a way? Are humans a par are I think it's asking are humans parasitic? I mean, yeah, kinda. Like <laughs> a little bit. Um, you know, gestures vaguely at the world. Um what else we got? Um Oh, MD Roberts, uh thank you for donating. Greatly appreciate it. Uh what software are you using? I'm gonna need more more context on that in uh, for what <laughs> um uh formal school is required for former schooling is required why so much free info that can be cross verified look i said this before and i'll say it again i think the vast majority of people who are interested in bio should go to school like learning bio on your own is fun but ultimately if you actually want to learn how to do it well the vast majority of people should just go to school. You should. It's just, it's just, it's better. Like you'll, you'll, that way you have access to laboratories where you can fail under um, circumstances where it's not going to be financially devastating. It's, you have experts surrounding you to teach you how to do the thing. Do I think that the academic system is perfect? Absolutely not. I think there's a lot of things wrong with it. I think they don't do a very good job of teaching a lot of the aspects of biology but I think they're going to do a better job than most people are able to, in to self learn. So I, I, you know, I mean, I, I don't like, like I personally didn't fit well in the academic system. It's why I dropped out, but I'm a weird potato. Like I, you know, I'm, I am very much the exception. I am not the rule. Um, I think the vast majority of people who are interested in this should just go to school and, you know, get a biochem degree if you want to work in this, because then it also, it doesn't just op open the opportunity to learn how to do the thing properly. It also get like the 99% of going to university is networking at the end of the day. Like the stuff you learn, you're, you're going to end up forgetting 95% of it or more. But really the, the whole point of going to university is it puts you into a system where it gives you access to, 
um, people and resources and opportunities and chances to get into labs to, to do the work that you want to do. Um, all right. Anyway, uh, what else we got? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Can you modify malfunctioning mitochondria in a fully grown animal? Yes. It's tricky, but yeah, you can do it. Um, there's a, I mean, the easiest way is just with like viruses. Um, you use like viral delivery and just push a lot of virus where you either where like specifically, or you can take, uh, take a bone marrow, bone marrow sample, isolate stem cells, modify the stem cells, put the stem cells back. Um, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, what software do you use for designing plasmids? It's called Benchling. Um, it's a, it's a free website. It's benchling.com. Not sponsored. I just really like it. If they want to sponsor me, uh, you should absolutely send me an email. Benchling people send me an email. I will happily shill your product. It's great. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's called Benchling. I, I highly recommend it. Um, could you do a tor tutorial for plasmid editing? That is what this is. <laughs> um, there's, there's a whole bunch. If you want to, if you want to learn more about editing plasmids, there's a whole series of the who's gene videos. Um, and I just did two full in-depth tutorials on the, an introduction to genetic engineering, where we kind of go through all the basics, um, how the, how the program works, how to write code, how, what the code looks like, what it works like, all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, I'm going to do one or two more and then we're going to wrap up for the day because I need a nap. <laughs> it's been, it's been a long week. Um, how do fungi make such hydrophobic spores? I honestly don't know. I assume it's probably like a waxy coating. Um, that's, yeah. Um, it's either, a, it's like either a waxy coating or it's just an extremely rough surface. Uh, rough surfaces are, tend to be fairly hydrophobic. Um, so if you, if you combine some sort of hydrophobic um, materials, like a very thin hydro hydrophobic layer on a very rough surface, you end up with things that are super hydrophobic. Um, how much do your projects cost on average? That varies wildly. Um, something like the Neuron Project is costing thousands of dollars, whereas, you know, Jerry cost, I think, 20 bucks from Etsy to, to buy a sample of slime mold. And uh, then, the, you know, the price of filament to, to 3D print mazes and, and like $4 for agar. So it, it really, it really depends. Um, like I say, Neuron Project, very expensive. Other projects, less so. Um, when can we expect a video? Uh, there was supposed to be a video out next week, uh, but it doesn't seem to be working. So, yeah. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, we're, uh, the, the video that was supposed to be coming out this month was a protein-based laser, and then it got downgraded to a dye laser, and then it got downgraded to the fucking thing won't work. Um, so uh, there might not be a video this month, but we're going to make a lot of shorts. There's, gonna, there's a bunch of shorts that are going to be coming out um, th like next week and the week after. If it, like, especially if we don't get a, a main channel video out, if the, if we, but then we'll have a main channel video out, if not this month, then within probably the second week of April, uh, uh, is, is the schedule. If we do end up getting a video out this month, then it'll be near, nearer to the end of April. It, it, that's just kind of the, the schedule. The, the plan is to have a vi one video out per month, but insofar as it's our first couple of months back, it's kind of, uh, a bit of a, a bit of a rocky start while we rebuild our, our, our back catalog of, of videos. Um, so anyway, that's, it's neither here nor there. Um, all right. I'm going to, I'm going to do one more. Uh, why do you work individually, not with the university? I mean, I don't work individually. I, I have a company now. Um, but I, I found academia to be beyond tedious. Um, it's, I just, I don't gel well with <laughs> bureaucratic hierarchy, hierarchies. I just, I don't, I don't like, I was already learning on my own before starting university. And so when I started university, I really found it distasteful because to me, it felt like being treated like an idiot, um, rather than being treated as a peer. Cause they don't, they don't treat you like a peer until you're in a lab or a graduate student. And even then, you know, it, it I, I, don't, I just don't deal well with hierarchies like that for a lot of people though. It's a really great way to learn and, and having somebody really experienced, um, you know, kind of be your boss and tell you what to do. I just don't, I just, I like, I, I didn't like the classes. I found that the, the stuff they were teaching me was out of date because I was also in the wrong program. Like I really needed to have find, uh, should have found a synthetic biology program, but 
back when I was in university, it was like 10 years ago. So there is not a lot of that available. Um, whereas now there's much better programs that focus more on synthetic biology. They'll, they'll cover the stuff that I would have wanted to learn. Um, but I was in sort of the wrong city at the wrong university doing the wrong program. So all that kind of added up and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm out. Fuck this. Uh, whereas now, you know, I've got my own lab and my own company and I've got a great team and we work on some really amazing stuff and it's just way more fun, frankly, because then I can work on whatever I want instead of what someone tells me to work on. It's, it's not complicated arithmetic. Um, all right, last one. Um, let's find out. I want to find a good question. Um, <laughs> can fungus get high? Now, this is legitimately, I have no idea. Not a clue. But I think it would be fascinating to, because, so they've, okay, so this, I'm going to be making a short about this at some point. It's just, I, it's, I'm waiting till springtime because this is a, it's sort of a springtime pro, uh, project where they found recently that plants respond to anesthetic. So if you expose plants to any of the normal anesthetics that we use on people, or maybe not still use, but have used, um, like things like uh, lidocaine or ether or propofol or any of these drugs, they stop. So like, not just, not just like carnivorous plants. Like carnivorous plants, if you were to take a, a Venus flytrap and stick it with propofol, it won't close anymore. Like it just, it stops. And that's, that's very weird. But even like a pea plant, like a pea, a pea plant, which is a, a viney plant, and it tends to like wrap around poles. So if you get, if you watch a time lapse of a pea plant growing, you'll see that the the leader thing on the end is like spinning around until it hits something, and then it wraps around and then really tightly and then grows past it. Um, and it, it'll keep doing this, where it basically is putting these little leaders um, to help it climb. But if you etherize it, or give it lidocaine or propofol or any of these drugs, it just stops. It just stops. It just, it turns off. Um, which is very, very strange that a general anesthetic would make a plant turn off. So I would love to see somebody try this in, in fungi. Like, I would love to see that. You know, see if you stick lidocaine into uh, a fungus, does it just stop spiking? And, but beyond that, if you tried caffeine, even. Like, it doesn't even need to be any of the, like, illegal stuff. Like, if you just use caffeine, does it spike more? Like, can, can fungi get a caffeine high? I don't know. And then, of course, if you try, like, the stronger stuff, like, but I mean, because then, then you got to wonder, right? Like, these, a lot of fungi produce, or not a lot, some fungi produce psychoactive materials. Is that affecting their spiking? Like, I would love to see a comparison of, like, oyster mushrooms versus psilocybin mushrooms and see, do they, like, do they spike different? Like, do they behave different? Like, is one just permanently high? I don't know. Um, so that's, uh, it's, it's just a weird, it's a weird concept. I'd love to see that. I, I have no idea if it, if it works, but it, it would be very, very cool. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's that. I don't know, but it'd be cool. I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a context where I would be down to hit a blunt with a fungus. <laughs> you know, just be sitting there like, Hey Joe, how's it going? And just looks at me and fungus glazed over <laughs> look I don't know man it'd be weird it'd be cool but I'm into it um no oh, uh Kronkorken thank you greatly appreciate it thank you for the donation um alrighty um <laughs> I think with that we're probably gonna call it for the day um and uh yeah yeah alrighty so anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed. This has been a lot of fun. Um, uh, definitely be sure to subscribe if you haven't. If you, I mean, if you haven't by now, come on. This is a good. <laughs> the channel only gets more ridiculous from here. I mean, what are you, you're missing out. Um, you know, if, if you want to support the show, the donation link is still below if you want to do that even after this stream is no longer live. It's greatly appreciated. Um, there'll be new videos coming soon. There's new shorts coming soon. Uh, lots of new content. Also, be sure to keep an eye on the community page where we'll be putting up, like, next month there'll be another poll to decide on what the topic for the stream is. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Uh, we're doing a stream every month. So, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed. Have a lovely, lovely day. And I will see you on the next one. Ciao.